Hello and welcome. Today's webinar is the impact of ride hail services on the accessibility of nonprofit services. My name is Brendan Williams. I'm the research program administrator at Portland State University's Transportation Research and Education Center. Trek leads the National Institute for Transportation and Communities, a university transportation center funded by the US Department of Transportation. NITSI consortium members are the University of Utah, University of Oregon, University of Arizona, University of Texas at Arlington, and Oregon Institute of Technology. NITSI's research priority is improving mobility of people and goods to build strong communities. Our presenter today is Dr. Diana Mason. She is an associate professor in the University of Oregon School of Planning, Public Policy and Management, and the director of the Masters of Nonprofit Management program. Her research interests include nonprofit management and governance, the organization and formation of interest and advocacy organizations, the political economy of the nonprofit sector, charitable giving, in the experimental research on collective action and fundraising activities. Our next NITSI webinar is on September 15th from 10 to 11 a.m. Pacific time, Data-Driven Mobility Strategies for Multimodal Transportation. And this is gonna be presented by the research team of uh, Yao Yan Wu and Abul Faz Karimpour from the University of Arizona. Sharisha Kothiri from Portland State University, and Zhang Fong Yang from the University of Utah. This presentation by Diana will be about 40 minutes long. Then we're going to have 15 minutes to answer your questions. During the presentation, please submit your questions via the Zoom Q&A feature rather than the chat. After the webinar, you will receive an email with a link to the video recording and presentation slides. If you're tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. Instructions on how to redeem the credit will be included in your post webinar email. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Diana. Great. Thank you, Brandon. Um, let me start my slides. And here we go. All right, um, so as uh, Brendan mentioned, um, my name is Diana Mason. I'm an associate professor at the School of Planning, Public Policy and Management at the University of Oregon. Um, however, I teach primarily nonprofit management. I, I consider myself a nonprofit scholar. Um, and um, you'll see as this uh, presentation unfolds uh, that this is a truly an interdisciplinary approach to understanding um, access and equity um, in transportation. Um, so uh, I conducted this research with a graduate student of mine named uh, Miranda Menard, um, who just recently graduated with a joint um, MBA and a master's in community and regional planning in my department. So um, this was, um, and this, I wanted to also thank um, NITSI um, for funding this project. Um, it's been a really interesting um, opportunity to uh, explore an area of um, research um, and community support that I'm personally interested in, but hadn't done a lot of research in before. So it gave me the opportunity to do that. So thank you. Um, so the main research question that we're addressing today is how are ride hail services like Uber and Lyft, um, which are also known as transportation network companies or TNCs, um, shaping access to services offered by nonprofit organizations. Um, and then secondarily, um, what is the impact of TNCs on mobility and equity um, in communities? Um, so just a little bit of background on what nonprofits are and where they kind of fit into um, the service provision mix in a lot of communities. So uh, nonprofits have a long history of partnering with government um, in delivering public services. So um, you may be familiar with them as charitable organizations or tax exempt organizations or voluntary organizations or community based organizations. But most of these organizations fall under the nonprofit banner and that they're mission driven 
um, and tax exempt organizations. And when I say tax exempt, I mean they don't pay income tax on their revenue, right? If they engage in commercial activities, they may pay sales tax depending on the state. Um, if, and they also are required to pay payroll tax and things if they have employees, but they don't pay income tax on their revenues. Today, um, there are over a million and a half registered nonprofits in the United States. Um, and they make up about 10% of uh, all of the employment in the United States and about 5%, a little over 5% of annual GDP. So we're, we're talking about a very large sector um, and a lot of jobs um, involved, although uh, most nonprofit organizations are actually quite small. So they're your community groups, um, social organizations, things like that and have no paid staff. They're run by uh, volunteer boards and volunteer members who do the work of the organization. So over the last um, couple of decades, um, nonprofit organizations um, have really stepped in um, as government has tried to shrink itself um, and privatize a lot of the services and programs that had previously been paid for um, directly by, uh, by, paid for and completed and undertaken by government. Um, so things like childcare and employment training and services, healthcare, um, addiction services, un um, supporting the unhoused population, mental health programs, food distribution. I mean, you think about the services that the nonprofit sector engages in in your, in your own communities, and you can probably think about how important they are to providing those public goods. They tend to partner with government though through contracts um, and grants. So they um, may receive both local, state or federal contracts or grants to provide a homeless shelter, for example, or to do um, outreach to recently incarcerated individuals uh, for as another example. Um, so they're very involved in supporting people who are kind of left out of most other types of programs and supports and economic opportunities um, in, our, in our communities. Um, they also do receive philanthropy, but um, most of the resources that flow into the nonprofit sector are actually either fee for service or government grants and contracts, um, not um, philanthropy. Um, what's interesting though, is there's been some studies that have shown that uh, the service provision in traditionally underrepresented or marginalized communities is really uneven um, in lower income neighborhoods. Um, so even when these organizations um, state as their mission to be supporting um, uh, people in particular communities, um, they tend to e even be based in more wealthy communities. So if they're working in the poor neighborhoods, their headquarters are often still in the wealthy neighborhoods. Um, they also, um, organizations that are based in lower income communities um, actually fail at a greater rate than organizations that are based in um, wealthier communities. And just as one example, um, uh, in Latinx communities across the country, um, organizations that, um, that serve that population um, are very niche. Um, for example, they work on things like immigration support. Um, and don't um, provide a wide range of services. So even though there may be a larger number of organizations in those communities, they don't provide everything that those communities might need. So um, these problems really lead to continuing um, inequalities um, between um, the folks who are providing the service and the people who are actually using the service. And as Allard wrote, um, taken together, um, these findings indicate that initiatives to strengthen faith-based and community-based nonprofit organizations are critical steps in achieving a sound public safety net and increasing the availability of assistance to poor populations. So basically what he said is he, he pictures and envisions these organizations as those that are really a part of the social safety net that we have in this country. Um, and yet they struggle to be able to provide the services that communities need. So the question then is well, where do TNCs fit into this, um, this issue, right? And we know um, from previous research and how um, 
how much TNCs have really taken over uh, a lot of transportation options um, in, around the country and even in some parts of the world, that TNCs and other emerging technologies like uh, autonomous vehicles may really reshape community mobility um, and, and, and um, customer um, and citizen accessibility of the services they seek. Um, nonprofits tend to be focused in areas that um, are, um, it's often a consideration that nonprofits will place themselves on like bus routes and things like that. But as um, the, um, the distribution of lower income neighborhoods changes um, and as communities change their transportation plans, um, um, there still may be very significant gaps left behind. Um, earlier studies uh, of TNCs have shown that they can help get folks to where they need to go. So for example, um, there's been some research that has shown that uh, um, hospitals have used them successfully to help improve patient um, attendance at their appointments. Um, it, they've been seen to be less biased than traditional taxis um, in, in um, turning down rides from people of color, um, for example. But they, um, we also know that lower income individuals are also much less likely to use TNCs than wealthier individuals. So although they may provide an interesting opportunity um, for folks um, with less discrimination, they're often um, not the first choice for individuals who need um, to get somewhere. So this study um, is an exploratory study um, of nonprofit leaders and some of their clients um, in the Seattle metro area. So it focuses not just on the city of Seattle, but um, Tacoma, Bellevue, along with parts of Kings, Nahomish, and Pierce counties. Um, so um, uh, my sample, uh, the folks I talked to lived in both urban and suburban areas of greater, um, greater Seattle metro. Um, Seattle itself has about 4 million people in the overall metro area. Um, it has a pretty robust uh, transportation system um, already with buses, light, light rail, commuter rail, uh, and even ferries um, to help folks get around. Um, and Seattle is also an early adopter of TNCs. So we have uh, an opportunity to study uh, the use of TNCs in an area that already has a lot of op options for people um, and see where the opportunities and challenges um, might arise there. This is just one map that shows sort of the uh, biggest or busiest routes um, in, in Seattle that is served um, by their transit system. They actually have identified uh, zones for times uh, to wait. So they, uh, the most common areas are have like a 10 minute wait goal and the uh, lesser traveled areas have like a 15 minute wait goal. So they, they have really um, approached their um, transportation pretty, pretty robustly. So this um, research uh, included 10 semi-structured interviews um, with eight nonprofit organizations serving um, uh, that serve, provide direct services to their clients um, and 10 clients of those organizations. Um, this was all done by Zoom or phone um, um, and during the summer and last fall. Um, that is a limitation of the study because mainly because I wasn't able to talk to as many clients as I would have liked to. Um, it's very difficult to reach people who don't have smartphones or aren't familiar with using um, Zoom technology um, or record, you know, so it just it made it really hard to find these folks and have a chance to talk to them uh, online. Um, so COVID um, challenged me in, in, in talking to as many people as I wanted to. I did, however, code um, all the interviews around themes of opportunities and challenges. Uh, with TNCs as well as other um, modes of transportation. Um, everything from getting to their appointments to their own um, sort of sense of independence and efficacy um, and the social activities that they might want to participate in wealth as well. So it's a pretty broad uh, ranging conversation about how they get around and how they think about uh, their options. So um, basically the, um, the top findings are that both clients and nonprofits agreed um, that current transportation methods, even in a place like Seattle, um, leaves gaps um, um, for vulnerable populations and underrepresented populations. 
Uh, and both groups also agreed that TNCs can help fill these gaps um, while other challenges um, continue to remain. So I'm not suggesting that TNCs replace uh, current forms of transportation, but they can be seen as, as one tool available to nonprofit leaders and even policymakers to help um, folks um, get around in the ways that they want to. So for our clients, um, they, they do occasionally use TN, TNCs um, and they use them more when they're being paid for by somebody else. So we'll talk a little bit about that cost factor um, um, uh, as we go through the rest of the presentation. Um, Uber and Lyft uh, do provide opportunities for increased mobility. Um, they come right to your location. Um, they're seen as friendly and courteous and on time. Um, uh, um, they are more convenient than access shuttles, um, which are paid for by the county um, and have to be booked in advance and are hard to get round trip bookings for. Um, like I've heard stories where um, from one of the clients where he could schedule the access shuttle to get him to, to an appointment, but he had to have at least a three hour warning before he could take it back. So if his appointment only lasted an hour, um, he would have to stand around for two hours um, before he was able to get home. So, um, so, it, so using TNCs is actually um, more useful uh, for folks in, in these types of circumstances with a five or 10 minute wait time before their ride, their ride arrives. They also um, see challenges, however. So the, the main, one of the main challenges is accessibility for those with disabilities. Um, particularly those um, who, are, who use wheels, wheelchairs. There are, are a small number of wheelchair, wheelchair accessible vehicles available in different markets, but they're very hard to access for folks. Um, so that continues to remain a challenge. Um, uh, folks uh, who either um, aren't familiar with smartphone technology or apps um, uh, have uh, can't they struggle to use the app or understand how it works? There were some comments about clients accidentally paying for the ride when someone else was paying for it for them. Um, so they had to then go through the process of getting reimbursed and everything. Um, and it, you actually have to have a credit card or a debit card in order to be able to use Uber and Lyft on your own. So for those folks who don't have a credit card or a debit card that they can use, that is an obstacle for them. Um, and it, some folks don't even have smartphones. So I, I met with, I interviewed several folks who were the clients of, of one organization. Um, They're primarily seniors and they did not own smartphones. Um, they called in to the interview on landlines and they had no interest in having a smartphone. So. Um, that, that remains to be an ongoing challenge. And the cost. So for folks who have a limited income, taking a $30 or $50 ride somewhere, particularly if, if you're coming from the outskirts of town, um, can be um, cost prohibitive for them. Uh, so um, some programs do allow uh, organizations to use grants from Uber or Lyft uh, in order to be able to pay for client rides. Um, so, um, so that is one thing um, that uh, needs to be paid for, for folks if they want these to be used. So here's a couple of interesting quotes. So I do appreciate Uber vehicles. I've had them take me over to Bellevue once or twice, just so I can get some shopping done. Uh, and then I call them up and wherever they drop me off. And when I call, I press the key on my phone and they're there. So uh, someone who is, you know, describing the convenience of having, um, uh, being able to hail an Uber or Lyft ride really quickly. And then um, somebody else said, the main problem I have is living on social security is I don't have the type of funds to go on Uber on a regular basis. So again, that cost factor is, is quite important. For organizations, um, we, I did find that organizations actually often do use um, Uber and Lyft to help provide transportation for their clients. So um, in some, some organizations, Uber and Lyft but the volunteer drivers were probably the favorites um, of the clients. Um, but when they can't get out to places, um, for example, 
uh, more far, fun, far flung places, sometimes Uber or Lyft was able to provide um, that service. Um, they're also, um, Uber and, and um, Lyft are also able to provide the first and last mile to their clients. So helping get someone from their home to a bus stop, for example, or home to a train stop. Um, um, so they don't have to walk um, that half a mile or a mile, which may be difficult for some people. Um, they can fill in where other transportation supports aren't enough, like bus passes and metro access and things like that, those access shuttles. And they're good for access to areas outside uh, um, that are covered by some of these um, other options. However, um, the cost uh, of using Uber and Lyft as an organization um, is quite significant. So um, the organization actually has to assign staff to um, coordinate the ride and pay for it. So they have to be in communication with the driver and the client. Uh, have to be able to book the location and figure out where the location is that the drop off or pickup is happening at. Um, and it also costs money to organizations who are picking up the bill for their clients. So that is not insignificant um, when they're say paying for 10 or 15 Uber rides a day that could be in the hundreds of dollars every day that they're covering. Um, and so one example of a leader, a leader said, um, Uber rides are much more time intensive for staff to do as they serve essentially as a smartphone for a rider who does not have a smartphone. Um, so they're doing all of the work behind the scenes and the staff time that's necessary to support that is pretty, is pretty high. So um, overall, um, so, uh, as transportation policy is being adapted uh, to the rise of new, new technologies like TNCs and autonomous vehicles, we need to recognize the impact um, of these on vulnerable communities and on being able to access the services that they need. Um, so being able to get to organizations, being, allowing the organizations to help them get to their appointments and things like that. Um, so they are using TNCs right now, but they're just um, mostly to just fill some of the gaps um, that are left uh, with the other um, sources. Um, so before I move on, I just wanted to see if there are any questions. So we'll take a break and then I'll, I have a little bit of time um, to share some recommendations um, for you as well. Let's see what we got here. Any questions? I saw someone had raised their hand. I don't see any open questions. Brendan, was there? Is, are there any questions that folks would like to put in the Q and A? Um, no, well, I've, I've encouraged people to. Um, so okay. maybe we'll just continue and take questions on at the end. Sure. Oh, okay. Here we have one now. Okay. Um, so do you have a sense of how often these gaps need to be filled? Um, um, a little bit. Um, things have obviously changed a lot over the last year with COVID. Um, the, the need for Uber and Lyft actually increased um, because volunteer drivers particularly or community shuttle buses um, had, you know, uh, the volunteer drivers couldn't volunteer or the community shuttle buses had tight limits on, um, on how many people could be on the bus. Um, so they actually, um, one organization actually were using Uber and Lyft a lot more um, than they had been um, to fill um, their gaps. Um, I can think of one organization specifically that I talked to and they provide a lot of support, transportation support for clients and um, they, um, they're, their drop rate, meaning the rides that they couldn't provide, uh, uh, fell significantly when they started use, using Uber and Lyft. So they are able to support more than 90% of requests now for rides um, when before it was a lot less, like 50 or 60%. So there are um, some, some pretty significant um, uses of Uber and Lyft out there. Any other questions? I think that's all. So yeah, if you want to continue on, I think you're getting into the recommendations section. Yeah. 
Great. Yeah. So, um, so based on my conversations with um, with both clients and uh, and organizations, um, I have I came up with a list of recommendations that I thought would be useful for both nonprofit managers as well as policymakers and planners to think about um, as they're looking for ways to integrate um, TNCs into uh, their transportation plans. Um, so the one is to first um, increase outreach to underserved communities. So um, even, even with the use of TNCs um, and other you know, volunteer driver programs and things like that, organizations were still struggling to uh, meet the needs of communities of color, uh, immigrant communities that don't speak English as their first language, um, uh, and um, some senior communities in, in being able to identify their needs and help them get the supports that they need. So some of the nonprofit leaders I talked to um, talked about um, doing more partnership, uh, collaborations and partnerships among organizations to help identify needs um, in particular communities that have been underserved. Um, to, uh, to be able to get them the places they need, whether it's bus passes or TNC rides, right? They, they can do a better job of, of better meeting the needs of their clients. Um, and there, there also are opportunities for better equity in, in funding. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, but uh, direct government grants uh, to support transportation needs and, and Uber rides to nonprofits ser serving vulnerable populations would help help offset some of those costs. So um, or encouraging and training nonprofit managers to use TNCs, I'd say that uh, a good healthy proportion of the, the leaders I initially reached out to didn't use TNCs at all and they didn't see a need for why, understand why I felt this study was important. Um, so helping them understand um, the, the needs of their clients, being able to train service providers in how to effectively use these types of options, um, and then understand how TNCs can serve um, and fill specific gaps um, for um, particular populations. Um, a big takeaway is that subsidies are necessary. Um, in order to support effective use of TNCs. So um, the cost of both the organizations and the clients isn't insignificant. And uh, it, it's not sustainable to expect or nonprofit organizations to be able to self-fund a large uh, program using TNCs um, at, at a high rate. So um, government subsidies uh, to support TNC use um, can help fill gaps um, that other sources of transportation um, don't meet effectively. Um, so um, instead of uh, folks who, who, who don't have mobility concerns, they might be, it might be easier to use TNCs to um, help transport them around the community and save the access shuttles um, and the wheelchair accessible vehicles for those who do need um, that type of support. Right. There is a federal program called the Job Access and Reverse Commute Program, which does provide direct funding um, to organ to governments and nonprofits can be subrecipients of governments to receive those grants. But nonprofits can't apply directly for these grants. So one opportunity is to remove that barrier and allow um, nonprofit organizations, particularly large nonprofit organizations who, who serve hundreds, if not thousands of people a year, um, the opportunity to apply directly for these funds. And then um, helping educate private foundations and philanthropy um, that this is a worthy um, use of their money um, in, in supporting um, client mobility and community mobility more broadly. So um, make technology more accessible. So um, there, I know Uber and Lyft have been trying with some things and I'm, I'm not totally up to date with all of the things that they've tried and either kept or discarded, but there are tools that um, both clients and organizations that can use that might help um, overcome some of the technology barriers that clients in particular face. So one would be to allow clients to use the app without a credit card 
and just use um, promo codes provided by a nonprofit organization to pay for the ride. Um, in which case then the organization could be directly billed while giving the um, client the autonomy to arrange for their own rides if they're able to do that. Um, and then um, one idea that one organization uh, staff person I talked to had was in um, locations that actually serve clients on site, like having a tablet or something set up um, where they can use, um, they can book rides through the organization's account, like right there um, in order to be able to get home um, and may or may not need support from a staff member to help them do that. Um, and then uh, using other tools that where the organizations can use a, a business um, platform for, um, for their clients to book rides and things for them was another idea that came up. Um, the other problem, and I already mentioned this, was wheelchair accessibility. So, um, so there's a couple ways and, and different, um, locale, different municipalities have tried different approaches to this. Um, one is to require increased availability of wheelchair accessible vehicles. So for example, if you allow Uber to operate in your jurisdiction, they have to have 10% of their vehicles must be wheelchair accessible, for example. So um, I believe California has been piloting this. Um, so um, that might be one solution to help with the wheelchair accessibility issue. The other one is to um, increase use of TNCs for clients not using wheelchairs. Uh, and then saving the wheelchair accessible methods and modes for those who do need them. Um, and that would free up a little bit more room and, and um, availability of those other forms of transportation like the access shuttles. So just to summarize, um, so TNCs can help fill gaps. Uh, they are not the solution to the problem of helping um, community mobility. But when used strategically, they can make a difference for folks who, who, for whom other modes of transportation just aren't realistic or very useful for them. Um, some nonprofits are using TNCs for client support, um, but others haven't even considered it. And so I think having a broader conversation and bringing uh, nonprofit leaders in your communities together, um, service providers together, to talk about client needs, um, I think would be a really important uh, first step for planners and policymakers to take um, in order to better understand client needs, but also tell and inform the nonprofit leaders about uh, what resources might be available for them out there. Um, they will require subsidies um, to be sustainable uh, for both clients and organizations. And they should be considered a tool um, to use um, when designing and updating um, plans for uh, transportation networks more broadly. So that is my presentation. Um, I'm open to questions or commentary um, that you might have. Yeah, thanks so much, Diana. Uh, so yep. please submit your, your questions in the Q&A. Um, we have um, we have one in the chat, which I, okay. I can I can handle one in the chat, but yeah. for the most part, it's much easier if you put them in the Q and A. Um, so, you mentioned that TNCs are not the answer to solving mobility problems. What is the ideal answer to solving mobility challenges? So, I think to be able to provide. Uh, my, my takeaway from all of this is that we need to provide options um, to folks. Um, and if it's not, so buses, access shuttles, um, TNCs, trains, light rail. Um, and so where folks, community shuttles, you know, um, where, where folks have choices that are available to them and then they're able to identify and access the ones that work for them the best. Right, so it's kind of a, and there, there needs to be a mix. So it's not one size fits all. I talked to one client who had, um, who had cerebral palsy and, and he was able to get around okay. He was able to walk, um, but standing for a long time was really hard for him. Um, and so taking the train during rush hour <laughs> um, meant when he arrived at work, he was exhausted, right? And, and had to try to start a work day um, while jumping in an Uber, although it was $400 a week 
for him to do this was the best option for him. So if, if we'd be able to subsidize some of that transportation costs that he might need um, or in others like him who have some types of disabilities um, uh, was, was, was the best thing for him to do. So, um, so thinking about ways that we could help find the, the transportation option that's best for um, each individual. Oh. Great, we have a few other questions. Um, and I guess um, one to just clarify for this, uh, the audience is, did you talk with any TNCs for this study? And did you get a sense of the TNCs perspective on their uses? I did not talk to TNCs, that's a good question. Um, some of the groups that I spoke with had um, been actually working with TNCs to try to answer some of these questions that I've brought up again in this study. Um, and some of the organizations I talked with also had received um, some grants from um, uh, Uber specifically uh, to help provide support to their clients. Um, so um, they, um, they, they had a perspective on how that partnership worked, uh, but I did only get it from, from one end of that conversation. Okay, we, how do the nonprofits who offer TNC options deal with the um, issues with their rider, customer rides for these large corporations when there is not normally a local person in charge to contact? Um, I'm not, I don't know what QA, QC means. Could you clarify? Um, yeah, um, well, we can, we can go on. Uh, okay, quality, so quality control. control. There we go. Um, that's a good question. You know, I actually, um, I didn't have anybody express complaints about the TNC rides, um, either organizations or the clients. Um, the only thing that kind of came up at times was because of the back and forth with the nonprofit and the client and the um, driver was that sometimes there was some confusion about what, um, what, where the person was being picked up. Um, and the clients not knowing like what car was coming to get them. Um, so there you have that kind of just the, the problems with translation um, on using um, the service and having a third party kind of organize the ride for you. Um, but I didn't have any complaints about um, quality of service or anything like that. Okay. Um, and now how about you mentioned, um, you know, issues of accessibility um, still existing with wheelchair um, and maybe needing some sort of requirement, but what about um, sort of other factors? Um, we have a question about family, families, you know, and whether you need car seats. Um, so I guess just how complicated is this um, to help clients out? One client I talked to, uh, not client, one organization I talked to actually mentioned that that TNCs were great to help transport whole families. <laughs> um, as long as, you know, it wasn't like six or eight people. Um, you know, if it was three or four people, it was a really great way to move a one family from one place to another. Um, uh, car seats, you know, those aren't, um, those are only offered in some um, localities. So that could be also, as a parent, when I've tried to use Uber and Lyft, there are no car seat cars available. So that could also be um, a challenge for, um, for families with young children. Um, I see this other question here, um, a sense of trip purposes that these nonprofits are providing and what percentage are medical trips um, and are any of the nonprofits a non-emergency medical transportation provider? Um, so there were a lot of medical trips um, a couple of them did provide a lot of um, non-emergency medical transportation. Um, a lot of that transportation was supported through the access shuttles. Um, and sometimes one, one organization I talked to actually contracted with a, a private taxi company to provide some of those, um, those trips as well. Um, 
they were also used to get folks to events and activities that the nonprofit was organizing. Um, one one folk one person I worked with mentioned helping you know, some of their unhoused um, clients get to where they're going. So like they show up at a food bank to pick up some food and they can't walk home with a lot of a big box of food. So they just put them in a Uber and Lyft and send them off um, to where they're going. Um, uh, so it's a and some for um, more social reasons. So it, it sort of depended on the organization, but they do use them for a variety of, of reasons. Um, um, they're not, Uber and Lyft are not, at least in Seattle at this point, when I talked to the, the, the leaders, they weren't um, eligible to uh, transport for some types of medical appointments and be, and be reimbursed um, by like Medicaid and stuff. So um, they were kind of off the table for that. All right, we have uh, another question, and and so I think this is sort of hitting on maybe the the newness of TNCs in the area of um, clients going and in receiving services um, from a nonprofit, and so um, it seems like you know uh, this is this is great, but it's private, and um, you know we we have you know we. We we're wondering whether you know the government subsidies are something that could reduce the cost, but how about government mandates? Um, and you, you sort of talked about you know percentages of rides and and things like that. Um, what would you say to you know and or what have you spoken to nonprofit organizations about um, getting ride credits from Uber and in particular if it just feels like a promotion versus a long term yeah. um, commitment? Yeah. So as I mentioned, um, some organizations have received grants directly from the TNCs, which um, is a, is a very direct subsidy of their services that they're providing um, to nonprofit organizations. I, I'm not, I don't know if those will continue um, um, into the future. I see um, that, you know, maybe charging less for rides um, with particular organizations if it's being paid for by government. That's one, that's one option. And I think the city could probably negotiate that um, in order to provide a license to operate or a state um, I do know in some places they are piloting using TNCs for more general rides. Um, I know it's a, it's a government funded thing. So I would, I would imagine that, that there was a negotiated price discount there, um, with government, but that's, that's a good recommendation. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, um, you know, so when we talk about government, what, um, what in particular could be a role for transportation organizations um, in different areas? I, I, um, we're talking in terms a lot that are, you know, Seattle doesn't feel necessarily unique to other places. And so um, in the perspective of this discussion, and I'm just wondering, is there is there um, sort of an, a solution you see with the government and transportation organizations with them? Um, so I, I think um, I think I think for planners um, thinking about the way that these um, new technologies CNC's and others can knit into um, what is already being offered I could see the government using and paying for um, medical rights, for example, for folks um, who um, don't have the same, um, you don't need wheelchairs, for example, and can successfully use a TNC, um, and then using the access shuttles for those who need more support. Um, I could see, uh, you know, providing support to organizations in, in training of the use of the app um, and in clients and training and use of the app or helping the, you know, encouraging Uber and Lyft to develop um, more tools that are, that are able to help make that interface less complicated um, when a third party is paying for something. Um, 
So those are just those are just some ideas that I think I think uh, longer term, I really want to make sure that the, the folks who are in direct contact and working closely with these populations are the ones that uh, are at the table when policy decisions are make are being made and that the needs of their clients and the impact on their organizations can be discussed and um, ideas and solutions can be identified to make sure that we're not asking nonprofits to you know, stop using the access shuttle and instead um, using TNCs when that would increase their, the cost to them you know, exponentially. So um, those are just some thoughts that, that come to mind. And, and then, you know, to sort of take the, uh, um, to talk about the difference in uh, places. And so we, I, this has been presented feels sort of universal. Some of the aspects we have TNCs and we have um, clients in need and nonprofits, at least um, is in talking about urban areas, but what do you see differences from Seattle and I don't know, Eugene or other places? Yeah, so that's the next big question is how are, um, are there the similarities and differences um, between urban suburban and rural areas um, that need to be addressed. Um, uh, there's a lot of people who live um, in more, more rural areas that don't have access to services um, very easily at all. And I think that um, uh, we need to, we, you know, we need to engage in that conversation and include these types of programs in the mix in offering that support. So um, you know, getting to a food bank when you don't have a car and you live, you know, five miles from the nearest town um, and there's no bus service can be really challenging. And is there a role for TNCs um, to play in that that can help um, those communities um, gain additional um, access um, to transportation? Um, so um, that that would be a next step for the research question is to um, look at some of, uh, talk to folks who live in um, more, more outlying suburban areas and more rural areas um, to, to get their perspectives as well. For like the nonprofit organizations, um, you know, they, they have a good familiarity with, this is a new thing. How, how do you feel like they're going to adjust? I mean, does it, does the training, where does it need to come from or what? Yeah, I, I think it's just an understanding and an awareness. So, you know, perhaps that's a role for um, government and funders um, to, um, you know, provide information about how, uh, you know, they already offer discounted bus passes um, to organizations that pass along to clients, like what are some of the other options available to them and how might TNCs kind of fit into that mix. Um, what are grants that are available either through, by Uber or others that can help offset some of those costs for them and make sure that organizations um, are aware of that. Um, and, um, and also better, perhaps better understand their clients' needs too. Um, that while organizations are often the first ones who know um, about client needs, they sometimes um, don't know everything. So, so um, ensuring that they also know better um, whether, you know, how their clients are getting around, what might be improved to support their mobility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, we still have time for some more questions. If you have anything, um, please submit it. Um, Diana, is there anything you'd like to additionally mention that comes to mind? Um, no, I, I, I would just like to re, you know, reiterate that this is, I, you know, I, I really hope that planners and policy, policymakers and nonprofit organizations and clients um, all work together to try to identify um, challenges to mobility. Um, and that nonprofit organizations are right in there because they, in a lot of cities and towns, they provide a a very significant proportion of the services that um, folks may need. 
So um, making sure that they're at the table when those conversations are happening would be, um, is my goal, right? That's why I, I was interested in this study is to make sure that the folks providing a lot of these services aren't left out of these, um, of these discussions. All right, great. Um, oh, okay. So we do, we do have an additional question. Um, understanding the need for government grants, how can individuals advocate for additional transportation resources? Yeah, I think, you know, making a good cost benefit analysis <laughs> is always useful um, when, when advocating for, um, you know, new sources of funding and policy change. Um, so understanding that for some folks using TNCs may be more cost effective um, than having a bus drive around, you know, all day, an access shuttle, for example, drive around all day to pick up two or three people. So um, so thinking, thinking through and, and understanding how and where they might come in and also just the quality of, the, of service for a lot of people when using TNCs is superior than other forms of transportation. So um, understanding that and, and, and advocating that folks, that all, everyone has a right to be treated well and receive high quality services um, can also make a big difference. Great. Um, okay, so I think I think we've got it all covered. Um, just like to do one last little promotion of um, of our uh, of our next webinar, which is on September fifteenth uh, at ten a.m. Pacific time, and it's data driven mobility strategies for multimodal transportation. So I encourage you to join us then. We have a large uh, research team joining us. Um, so it should be great. And Diana, I just want to thank you again. This was really nice of you to, to take this time and, and present today. Um, anything you'd like to add? Um, no, I want to thank you. Um, thank you for your time and your support. And thank everybody who attended today. Um, your questions were really thought provoking and, and interesting. So. Um, please, um, my email um, is in the slides that will be online. So if you have any further questions or ideas or feedback, um, please feel free to send them along to me. Great. Thank you all. Have a nice day.